Stand by. You're about to witness the future of financial empowerment. The live show starts right now. Well, the the unemployment rate now stands at 5.8%. In is there is there a more worthless number in this day and age that we get every single week than the unemployment rate? I mean, is is it's down from uh, uh, we just it just keeps coming down and down and down and down and down every time we it's if if the market doesn't create this is this is a good rule of thumb for all you guys right there if we don't create at least one hundred and fifty thousand jobs we're not keeping up with the rate of new people coming into the workforce every month so one hundred and fifty thousand is the is kind of the number it's it's the one you want to watch out for. And we uh, we hit it the last couple of times we've been out there, but guys, there is the the true unemployment rate in America is something like fourteen percent, and the the reason that the number keeps coming down and down and down is because there there are some people who are currently looking for work who are finding work, but the vast majority of people aren't even looking, and because they're not even looking for work. Uh, the unemployment rate continues to drop because if you if you're if you haven't looked for work or and you haven't worked a, here's a, here's this, the numbers are really funny if you haven't looked for work then you're not considered unemployed also if you have worked at least one hour in the last month you're not unemployed you're considered employed can you believe that so if a guy's out there and he's working odd jobs. And uh, he managed to eat together a couple of hours of work throughout the week, hauling trash or, you know, working for a buddy at a, you know, pouring concrete or something like that. When the uh, folks call him up and, and they do the, you know, they do the census on this thing, they say, hey, have you worked in more than an hour in the last month? You're like, well, yeah, I went out there and I stirred concrete for a couple of hours because I, I needed a few bucks. Well, now suddenly you're employed. And so these numbers, the, the unemployment number especially, is just a, a completely fraudulent, unrealistic, uh, unaccurate number of what's actually going on in the economy. And it's sad, really, because it looks like on paper things are just improving dramatically. I mean, five, basically four and a half percent unemployment is full unemployment uh, is full employment. Four and a half percent unemployment, four percent is roughly full employment. That was the number that we had. Uh, you know, rolling through the end of the Clinton administration into the, the Bush administration. Uh, the first term there was somewhere around, it was basically full employment. And uh, it's, it's just sad to see that, you know, it looks like on paper we're at 5.8, like everything's going really well, when obviously it's not. Um, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the live show. I'm your host, Jason Stapleton, coming to you from the Trade Empowered Studios here in the heart of America. I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, sorry for that little tantrum here at the beginning. I just every every week I look at these numbers as a as an investor and as a trader, and it's just it baffles me that we that that's it, people just use that and really that the talking heads use this number as and they the, to their credit they do point out that it's really flawed and that it's really kind of not a not a very important number anymore because of all the problems that exist in the way that the number is generated but um nonetheless it's still reported it'll be reported across the news you'll read it in the wall street journal you'll read it in uh, uh the new york times about how the unemployment rate has fallen to five under six percent and it's just a joke uh, but today, as I promised you guys, last week I was out, ended up being very sick on the day that we normally run the live show. So as promised, today we're going to start off the discussion talking a little bit about China and about what's going on there. Because I think that there, there will be some valuable insights for all of you international traders, you guys who are dealing with international markets, which is basically all of you. Because if you are in the markets right now, things are so heavily correlated from country to country, from currency to currency, that there is a there is very little chance that this is not going to affect you and affect your portfolio and affect your lifestyle moving forward if you don't pay attention. So we're going to talk a little about the China thing, and then we're going to talk uh, some about unemployment, or I'm sorry, not unemployment, but the minimum wage and raising the minimum wage. There is a huge push here in the United States to raise the minimum wage at this point to about $10.10 .10 an hour. 
And I want to talk to you a little bit about that and share what happens when you raise the minimum wage and not what just happens to the worker or to the employer, but what happens to you? What does it mean to you, the guy who makes 60, 70, 80, 100, 200 thousand dollars a year? What does it mean to you? Because those people oftentimes with a good heart make very bad decisions. And raising the minimum wage is a very bad decision. It has almost no good implications. Almost none. And the, ones, the good implications that it does have are temporary. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. But I just want to welcome you guys so much for, for being here and being part of the program. If you like what you watch here, we could use your help. Please go to patreon.com forward slash the live show patreon.com forward slash the live show and please donate to what we're doing here uh we have a we have a a, a, so a lot that we want to do with this show and it's only through your support as a viewer that we're able to do that so if you like it subscribe on youtube and go to patreon.com forward slash the live show and help us out so here's what's going on a couple of weeks ago i read a newsletter almost every week. I'm fairly religious about reading it, and it's one put out by a guy by the name of John Malden. Now, John Malden is not a... Uh, he actually he went to college to be a pastor. Did you know that, Darren? Yeah. He has a degree... A, he went to seminary, and after he got out of seminary, he started a direct... or He was working for a print shop, and he started doing a lot of direct mail pieces for this print shop. And as that, he started to get pretty good at that. And so he started a direct mail business. And over the course of that time, what he started, he, he took an interest that he had in, in finance and economics, and he started putting out a newsletter about his thoughts on what's happening in the economy from a, a, on an economic standpoint. So he takes a look internationally and talks a little bit about what's happening. Um, he is, so he's not an economist. I don't know if he went back to school and got a degree in economics, but he, he is, he's not a classically trained economist, but he has some really, really awesome insights. And he takes, this is not a small, like, newsletter that he, or a weekly deal that he puts out. I mean, it's, it's pages long, typically. I've got, uh, I don't know how many pages this one is. It's, oh, something like 15 or 16 pages. So the, the guy is writing a lot of information every single week, and he's backing up what he's talking. He knows some of the best guys in the industry in terms of economists and traders and investors throughout the world, and he calls on all of those people to kind of help with the insight and the analysis and as well as giving his own. I find it just a fascinating read, and it really helps to key me into what's happening in the world and, and, and hopefully tip me off to an angle on the market that I hadn't considered. And so for any of you guys who have who are not part of what I don't subscribe to John's newsletter, it's worth going there and, and signing up. It's thoughts from the front line. He doesn't do very much like, you know, marketing type stuff. It's really the majority of it is just the newsletter. And uh, and it comes out every week on Friday or Saturday. And it's, it's a great read. Well, a couple of weeks ago. He started talking about, uh, he was gone, and so he brought in one of his, I think he's an understudy, uh, but he's not like an understudy, like somebody who doesn't know anything. He's actually spent several years working on as an analyst on a, you know, on a billion-dollar portfolio, and uh, he knows quite a bit about what's going on in China, because that was kind of an area of expertise that he had. So he's got somebody else in writing the letter for him this week, or a couple of weeks ago, but the discussion was on China. And what was happening in China? Now, the general belief is that China is this, this backbone of a, of a thriving, industrialized nation that's just kicking the butt of everybody else, and they're just doing a better job of everything. And they're creating more products, and they've got lower labor costs, and they're just there. They are the new industrialized world. And to a large extent, that's correct. And people are worried about uh, China's taking over everything. They're getting all our jobs. And you've got the, you know, the, the hard weirdos that think that, you know, jobs are being shipped overseas to China. And we ought to, you know, have legislation to prevent that from happening. And all kinds of madness. Talk about piling one bad idea onto another. But I want to talk with you specifically about what's really happening in China and the real risks that are being posed there. And this is not a new concept. Um, it's fairly new to me. I'm just now digging into the weeds on this, but um, we're going to talk a little bit about it today. Basically, 
here are some a little bit of facts and figures that I have from 2000 and I think 2010. So they're a little bit behind, but the situation could not is has not gotten better. Let's put it that way. Um, for example, one of the things that have for about 30 years, China has had plus eight percent growth in their country. Now they had a they, they had a long way to come, so it's not like they you know they're generating it from the same place that America or Great Britain would be from. But they've had over 8% growth. It's just radical growth. And over the course of that time, they have, they've hit a couple of walls. And instead of doing the right thing and allowing the economy to contract a little bit and heal itself and then move forward, they've made some, some decisions that a lot of people here in America would think would be good, but are leading to a, a very dangerous outcome. For example, raw materials. Um, China has consumed just 65% of the cement that it produced over the past five years after exports, all right? It is currently outputting more steel than the next seven largest producers combined. It now has 200 million tons of excess capacity of steel, more than the EU and Japan's total production so far this year. So they're consuming, or they're, they're producing far more goods than they can consume or they can export. So that's problem number one. Number two, property construction. The, there's a current excess of 3.3 billion square meters of floor space in the country, yet 200 million square meters of new space are being constructed each year. So we have a lot of space, retail, commercial, industrial space, that's being created in China, but there's already a massive amount of excess capacity. Does this sound familiar? Do you remember in America, Darren, uh, five, six, seven years ago when you uh, we, we were driving around town? I remember literally on virtually every corner, somebody was building a strip mall. New commercial buildings everywhere. Why? Because you could get thirty-five dollars a square foot for it here in the here in Kansas City, which is a great prize, which is a really high price, a premium price for um, real estate here. And so every developer was out there building, and it wasn't the the People were buying it up, but you had huge chunks of strip mall and, and, and commercial buildings that were being built that had no tenants in them, and they were continuing to build. You'd be building one across the street, and there'd be a brand new one going up before the spaces were even leased. Massive amounts of construction. Here's, this is another really dangerous one, and we saw this in America too. Average price-to-rent ratio in China's eight key cities is 39.4 times. The figure was about 23% in America just before the housing crisis. So here's what's happening. Is there's a large amount of money being created and, and capital flows that are going into production of goods and services that aren't being used because the government runs the banking sector, so they're getting very cheap, um, they're getting very cheap prices for to borrow money. That money doesn't have a lot of places to go. So it's been going into the real estate market, large chunks of it. Okay. And what he says here is, is Chinese corporations, households, and government uh, entities have invested excess liquidity in the property markets, driving up prices to what he calls unsustainable levels. The, prop, the, the result is that the property is out of reach for the majority of ordinary Chinese. Now, we heard this as well in America, didn't we? Um, talking about how um, you know interest rates were too high, the lending standards were too great, property prices were too high. This is one of the major reasons for rent control and the belief that, oh, well, we'll just artificially hold prices down and that will allow people who make lower wages to have access to, you know, to have access to, to places to rent and, and, and to own. And then in the banking, as with the credit crisis the West, uh, in the West, the bank's exposure to infrastructure credit bubbles uh, isn't obvious because the debt is held in local investment companies, shell entities which borrow from Chinese banks and invest in fixed assets. So what he's saying is, is that there, the, the how much debt is actually on the books right now is tough to calculate. So we have a, a host of problems. We've got China is producing more goods than it can possibly consume or export. We have property construction that exceeds the need, so more production than they need. We have 
property prices that are going through the roof, even though there's excess space, people are buying properties. So they're buying the buildings, they're buying the houses, they're buying the, the retail spaces, the actual construction itself, which drives up the price of all real estate. And they're doing that because they don't have any other place to put the money. And then last but not least, the banking sector is sheltering a large debt that cannot be readily identified because of the way the private companies hold the assets, um, you know, hold, hold, the, hold the money in fixed assets. So this is not looking good. Now, what's even more frustrating is that after 30 years of sustained economic growth topping 8% and a successful bank cleanup in 2000, the People's Republic was well on its way to blowing through the middle income trap and transitioning to a more advanced consumption-based economy. But then in 2008, the banking crisis in the United States abruptly ushered in a painful area of balance sheet repair across the developed world and delivered a demand shock to emerging markets. This is the key. Rather than allow the Chinese economy to fall into recession at such an inconvenient time, the party leadership sprang into action, stimulated demand with the largest fiscal deficit in more than 60 years, and to mobilize bank lending with historic low interest rates and enormous liquidity injections. Now, it wasn't long ago when we were doing some trillion dollar bailouts here in America and people were talking about the end of the dollar, the collapse, the debt to GDP ratio is massive. It's approaching 70, 80 percent. It's over that now. But as it was approaching that level, people were crawling up the walls. Gold shot through the roof. There was a general belief that the world, that, that the U.S. would lose its status as the world currency and that it were replaced by something like the Chinese currency or some other international currency. Darren, do you want to venture to guess what the debt-to-GDP ratio is in China? Guess. 95? Yeah, you're close. You're close. Um, the, you could see for, uh, China's debt-to-GDP grew by roughly 20% per year from just under 150% in 2008 to nearly 210% at the end of 2012 and continues rising through, continued rising through 2013. Even more ominous, corporate debt has soared from 92% to 150% today against the expectation that China's government would always backstop defaults. Do you know what China's default rate has been for the last well, roughly 30 years or so? Take a gander. <laughs> Zero. China did not allow defaults. You just could you literally couldn't default. Now, if you can't default, if you're yeah, if you are too big to fail, why not acquire debt? And not only that, but the government's giving you, the banks are giving you all virtually free money. They're like, here, come take this cash. Is it any surprise that they're out building uh, building buildings that nobody wants to rent? Is it any surprise that they're then taking the construction workers and people who have jobs now because the government's been pumping liquidity into the market or going out and buying real estate and jacking up the prices of real estate? Is it any surprise that we've got 200 million tons of steel that hasn't been used? This is a dangerous situation in China. And nobody is talking about it. So when we come back, I want to talk a little bit more about this China situation and, and explain about, you know, kind of what the thought processes are of how you fix it. But the problem with that is, is none of the, none of, like any of the situations we talk about here, none of these options are good. All of them lead to a, lead to a contracting Chinese economy and potential Chinese recession. And what is that going to mean for the U.S.? What does it mean for Australia and New Zealand, whose exports uh, are real, uh, have helped to keep those countries afloat as well? So we'll talk about that when we get back. Give me a few minutes, and we'll talk to you soon. You're listening to The Live Show with Jason Stapleton. For more information, visit us on the web at www.theliveshow.tv. Oh, you know, guys, there is 
Ladies and gentlemen, there are more issues at stake here than simply the fact that there is mounting debt and uh, massive amounts of spending that are happening. In addition to that, for they're, they're continuing to spend money in China and they're getting less and less of a return on that capital every time they pump more liquidity in. Now, this is an economic event that occurs when you have sustained um, capital injections and very, very low interest rates and money is cheap for an extended period of time. Because what happens is when you pump money into the market, initially the people who really need it, who have viable businesses who are now getting the gift of low interest rates and can now produce a, a larger profit on their viable business ventures, end up putting money into that. But eventually they have all the capital that they need. And the question is, well, what do we do now? What's, what's the plan? The, the money's still here. It's still cheap. So they have a choice. Am I going to continue to take on more debt or take on more capital and try something that's a little bit riskier? Or am I going to just simply sit back and let my competitors do it for me and potentially reap the windfall profit return? You also have people who would never have been able to start a business, who never should be starting a business, or people who are involved in arbitrages and, and risky investment deals and risky uh, uh, types of real estate ventures that would never fly if interest rates were higher and the risk of default was greater. But because none of those problems exist, you see a massive amount of pull for this capital. And it goes into riskier and riskier ventures. And wouldn't you know it, the riskier the venture, the more defaults, the greater, the lower return, because you're, you're going into a bunch of unproven business models that have very, very high risk of failure. And so because of that, what you're seeing is in China is that the more money they pump in, they're getting less and less bang for their buck. And that will continue to happen as long as they continue to pump money into the market. But there are several things here that are outlined that need to happen in order for China to fix its problem. And I'm going to run through them very briefly with you. First one is to stall the credit growth, okay, especially on the risky lending. So what they're saying is they need to contract monetary policy. Now, they can do that either by making it harder to get capital or putting specific restrictions on what the capital can be used for. All right. But one way or another, they need to stop the rapid expanse of credit growth in China. Secondly, they need to keep rolling over the bad debt. So you've got a lot of people now who have a lot of bad debt and they can't make their, their interest payments. They can't even make the interest payments on it anymore. And what they're saying is, at least in the short run here, we just need to keep rolling over that. The banks need to go back and just refinance that debt and re-roll it over because what happens when we, if, if those companies go into default, if, they, if all of the people who can't make a mortgage payment who can't make a, a, you know, an interest payment, are allowed to default, it will crush the economy. So for the majority of people, we just need to keep rolling over the bad debt. And then last but not least, start non-performing non loan disposals. So China has indicated that although it normally has a 0% default rate because it just wouldn't allow um, companies or in institutions to default, it has decided and has shown that it intends to allow companies to default. Uh, and take them, <clears throat> you know, take them out of the market. And what this article suggests is that they're going to have to do that at some point. They're going to have to start taking the worst of these cases, or maybe not the worst of them, but s chunks of them, and start taking them out and disposing of the non-performing loans and write those loans off and take the hits and take the losses. All of that, all three of those things that they're suggesting are going to hurt China's economy. They're going to slow the growth because the, the growth is entirely predicated on cheap, li cheap liquidity being pumped into the market all the time. If you take any of that back, if you pull any of it out, you're going to destroy the economy. There are a lot of people in America who say, well, we just need to balance the budget today. We run a trillion dollar deficit a year, and I don't know why those guys can't just go in there and all of a sudden just fix it and say, all right, we're going to cut this and this and this and this, and we're going to cut a trillion dollars out of the budget, and we're going to have a balanced budget, and the world will be perfect. I can't imagine the firestorm, the recession that would hit if you suddenly pulled a trillion dollars a year out of the U.S. economy, all right? Because, yes, they're printing it. Yes, they're stealing a lot of it from you. 
to put into these other programs. But the bottom line is, if you say, if the government says, just suddenly, all at once, we're going to stop spending a trillion dollars, that money does get spent. It does go out. It goes out to contracting companies, and it goes out to individuals for, uh, you know, to who get paid by those companies. It go, there's a whole host of things that happen with that money. Money gets pumped into the economy. If you suddenly draw that money out, you it would be catastrophic. What has to happen is, is you have to agree, um, we're going to cut a penny a year off of every dollar that gets spent in government. And over the next 10 or 20 years, you will slowly suck that liquidity out. But what will happen is you will stall some growth when that occurs. There's just no way to avoid it. But China is going to have to start doing that. And anything they do is going to hurt growth. That 8% target that everybody looks at, now they're starting to say, well, maybe it'll be 6 I mean, we're talking a significant reduction. For places like Australia and New Zealand, whose major exports are, are mineral ore and minerals, gold, steel, those types of things, those major exports that they have that are going to China. I mean, the real estate market, I don't know if you've looked, Darren, because I've been shopping real estate in Australia. Um, the real estate in Australia is astronomical. They've had, they're, it's, a, it's a huge real estate boom over there right now and has been for a long time. They weathered the storm of the global recession really, really well. And the reason they did that is because China was buying all of their exports. And of course, they're buying it, taking on debt, and now stockpiling it after they convert it into a product. So the question is, what's it going to do to Australia and New Zealand and some of those types of countries that are major benefactors of the large growth in China? I would expect to see as China tapers back, if they choose to do it, if they'll actually do it, as they start to taper back, it's going to hurt those countries as well. So you need to be prepared if you're in Australia if um, and some of those types of places. Um, real estate prices and those types of things are probably not going to see the incredible returns over the next decade that we've seen in the last. And one of the very difficult things here is predicting when it's going to happen. Because as I said in, in the book, The Tipping Point, one of the real struggles with predicting when it's going to occur is that we don't know because we don't know what the catalyst is. All decisions, all, markets are driven by psychology. They're driven by the actions of individuals. And it is very difficult to tell how the mass is going to interpret data or what specific thing is going to be the catalyst that will cause the massive landslide. But what we do know is there is a huge hill being built in China right now. And at some point, a grain of sand is going to fall on the top of that and an avalanche is going to occur. And when that happens, you don't want to be standing anywhere close to it. But does that happen this year? Does it happen next year? Does it happen in five years or ten years? We don't know. That's what makes it very, very difficult um, to predict these types of things until we get right up next to it. But I wanted to bring it to your attention and talk about it because a lot of people think that you just there's so much misinformation out there about what's really going on in, in the world financially, what countries are doing well, what countries are doing poorly. And most of the time, I'll read you the closing thoughts on this because it really is, he, he had some very big, he had a really nice closing thought here. Let me just find it. I think it's right here. Over the last 50 years, every investment boom coupled with excessive credit growth has ended in a hard landing. From Latin America's debt crisis of the 80s to Japan in 89, East Asia in 97, and the United States after both the late 90s, internet bubble, and the 2000s housing bubble. The lesson is always the same. It's hard to avoid. Economic miracles, miracles are almost always too good to be true. Broad-based, debt-fueled overinvestment, which is a misallocation of capital, may appear to kick economic growth into overdrive for a while. But while disappointing returns and consequent selling led to investment losses, defaults, and banking panics, and in the case where foreign capital seeks stronger growth is already high, uh, is, is already highly valued asset drivers in the investment boom, the miracle often ends with capital flight and currency collapse. This doesn't end well. It never ends well. 
Everybody thinks that they can control it. Every government thinks that they can step in and they can get just the right concoction of debt and credit and when we pull back and when we pump in and that somehow we're going to create a soft landing here. It never, ever, ever works. And it goes back to one of the core tenets that we preach here is that, is that free economies, free people, free societies are not without their problems. You have booms and bust cycles. You have people who are very wealthy and those who are very poor. But how do you provide the most opportunity to the most amount of people and provide the highest standard of living to all people? Will you do that with the freest society possible? And anytime you start gumming up the works, anytime you start messing with interest rates, anytime you start arbitrarily setting interest rates or wages, which we're going to talk about in a minute, the unintended consequences of that are disastrous. And if you're not, if you don't understand these principles, if you don't understand what happens when you create cheap money for extended periods of time, when you when you set when you have companies that are too big to fail, then you end up biting off on the belief that hey, the Federal Reserve does have a responsibility. Booms and busts exist whether you've got a puppet master pulling the strings or whether you've got a free market. One of the things we do know is that in a free market, the recessions are less deep, the highs are less high, and the time frame from low to high is much faster. I mean, the Federal Reserve has been gumming up the works here for the last, uh, you know, five, six years. Well, since 2008. 2014. Have they been able to create any type of growth? No. It's been stagnant. We're just now back to the employment that we had in 2008, which means every single person who's entered the workforce until now still doesn't have a job. Now explain to me how the unemployment rate's 5.8%. How does that work? It doesn't. Let me save you the trouble. It doesn't work. That math does not work. And when we come back, what I want to talk about is I want to get into this, this unemployment thing. And I don't want to have a real conversation with you. Not some sort of like political, um, ideological angle on uh, minimum wage prices. I want to explain to you what really happens when you raise the minimum wage. Uh, and, and share with you a little bit and, and pose some questions to you that are going to be very, very valuable in your analysis of whether or not we ought to be talking about this in America. So stick around. We'll be right back. I think the best way to talk about this today is to, uh, we're, we're going to talk about minimum wage now. Um, the best way to discuss it is to discuss a little bit about how America works for those of you who do not live in America. Because we have a, I don't know if you know this, but we have we have a massive international following. Um, and many of you don't understand. The, there, is a, there, is a, there, is a, there is a large and growing central government in America, and then there are individual state governments. And inside of those states, the, the general idea when America was founded is that we will have a small centralized government that would deal with some very specific issues dealing to, with inter, interstate commerce and, and national security and some of those types of things. But that all, um, all of the roles and responsibilities not express, uh, expresses, uh, yeah, expressly provided for in the Constitution would be left to the states or to the people. So the idea is, is that we've got, you know, 50 little uh, incubation chambers here in the United States and that those states can do pretty much whatever they want to in terms of setting prices and and creating an environment where people want to live and want to work and want to start businesses. And that those little incubation chambers can can provide a, a ground to test new ideas. And so. The beautiful thing about the states, the way we've created it is, is that if 
Wisconsin wants to raise their corporate taxes to 90% and Texas doesn't want to have a corporate tax, you get to see the ramifications of that. You get to see what it costs Texas to not have that revenue, and you get to see what it costs Wisconsin in terms of their in terms of the diminished number of companies that will move there in order to start their businesses. You also see the flight of individuals from one place to another based on the type of taxes, state taxes or no state taxes, how much regulation they want to apply on a specific company or on individuals, how difficult they want to make it. All of these things have an effect, and it causes people to move from state to state, from area to area. It causes uh, specific uh, states to go in, in boom and bust cycles on their own. And it's wonderful to be able to see that. And that is the, I believe that was a framer's intention when they put that together. It may not have been to create incubators, but the idea that you would have a set of free and independent states that could operate, you know, largely on their own was a concept that they developed when they founded the country. Article in Investors Business Daily today or this week was minimum wage increases gain momentum in the states. Obama Democrats see campaign issue. Businesses say hikes will cost jobs. So places like Maryland and Connecticut are now agreeing to raise their minimum wage. Uh, Maryland here from uh, the current seven dollars and twenty five cents an hour to ten dollars and ten cents an hour by two thousand and eighteen. Um, and then that's about a 40% increase in the minimum wage, 40% increase in the minimum wage between now and 2018. They're going to be phasing that in. And I think Connecticut was, uh, the same thing, minimum wage, uh, to 950 an hour, or that's Minnesota to 950 an hour, um, in steps starting in 2018. So basically these guys are going to start looking at raising their minimum wages. And the question becomes... Now, first of all, if states want to raise the minimum wage, I think it's a stupid idea, but you can certainly do that. There's nothing, there's nothing saying that states cannot raise their minimum wage and provide um, unskilled labor a higher rate. But this is what I want you to remember. The question is, is this a good thing? Is it a good thing for the laborer? Is it a good thing for the, for the company? And is it a good thing for you, someone who has nothing to do with either? And the first thing that I want you guys to think about is every time you hear minimum wage increase, what you're really talking about is what is the minimum price for unskilled labor? Because, ladies and gentlemen, people who are involved in minimum wage jobs are typically those of very low skill. And I use the example of, a, uh, of, a, of me, for example. Um, I know nothing about working at a, at a burger joint. Absolutely nothing. If I showed up at a burger joint and I wrote out my resume, international currency trader, talk show host, company, you know, founder of uh, one of the largest trading education companies in the world, and I would have wrote that down and I slide that across the sheet to the manager who's sitting behind the desk and I'm applying for the fry cook position, he's going to look at that and go, well, that's awesome. Yeah, you may be a bit overqualified to run the fry machine here at the at the the Happy Meal uh, at the uh, at the Happy Burger, but you don't know anything about running a burger joint or even working in a burger joint. Therefore, if I hire you, you I have to teach you everything. Not only that, but there's a risk that you might leave next week, and all the money that I spent on you will be worthless, and I've spent time training you up just so you can go somewhere else. And so, look, I got no idea of your work ethic. Maybe you blew everything up, and that's why you're here looking to flip burgers and work a fry machine. So here's what I'll do. I'll pay you five bucks an hour. That's really all I'm willing to invest in you. And I, and I really need the job because, uh, you know, trading hadn't been going so well, and the show's not taking off, and we're not making any money, right? So I take the job. Is the frog. So I show up the next day and I got some, you know, pimple faced 14 year old who's teaching me how to run the fryer and giving me my little uniform that the company had to pay for. And I'm figuring out how to use the headset and how to take the orders and how much shaker salt I got to put on the thing and all this stuff. I, I'm putting that all together. I'm getting paid nothing for that because I'm skillless. All right. This is what happens when you come into an organization. Now, what happens? 
after I worked there three months, six months, a year. Well, if I've done a good job, if I've worked hard, the company has moved me from the fry position to the burger flipping position. And I'm learning how to make the burgers. And I got that down. I got the, you know, the Super Mac uh, burger that I know how to make. And I can make the French fries. I can run the drive through which is like the hardest thing to do, apparently, in a fast food restaurant. And I got a pretty good head on my shoulders. And so, you know, I'm increasing productivity and things are starting to happen. And before long, the assistant manager who was working at the Happy Burger decides he's going to go over to Tom's Burgers. And there's an assistant manager job that's opened up. And I say, hey, I'd, I'd like to have that assistant manager job. And they say, all right, we'll give you a try. Then pretty soon a management job opens up. But I don't have a college degree, but that's a requirement. And so then I start going to night school. After I'm done, I'm, I'm, making, I'm doing a lot better than minimum wage now. Doing a lot better than minimum wage. And I got the opportunity now, if I want to work extra hard, I can go to night school. And I can work my way up into a manager position. Or maybe Tom's Burgers doesn't require a college education to work as a manager. And that's why the other assistant manager left. I now have all the skill sets that I need to be competitive in any burger restaurant. This is how people at McDonald's go from fry guy to owning McDonald's franchises. It happens. But those people who are making minimum wage are folks who are young, who are new, who are coming into the workforce. We're talking about 5% about of the workforce. They're either young and skillless or they have made some mistakes in their life to be a 35-year-old fry guy. Either that or it's a temporary situation when they're moving between jobs and they're trying to pick something up. My point being is that for those people who want to work their way up, the, the, the low-end job, the entry-level job, is the catalyst to get in the door. When you raise the cost of unskilled labor, there, am, there are a massive amount of unintended consequences that happen to the worker. So let's start with the worker, okay? Because the, the general premise here is that, the, is that we need to pay people a livable wage. And I'm using my air quotes for those of you who are watching this on or listening to this on iTunes. Um. Let's start out with, with that, and let's say what happens when we, when we raise it for the worker. Now, first of all, I, Darren, help. what's a livable wage? That's a, nay, what is it? Because here's, here's what I thought. I thought if you had a job and you were alive, that you're being paid a livable wage. Is it livable in America or in Somalia? You know, what is the standard of living that we say no one should have to live below this standard of living. You know, is it should everybody be able to own a house? Should everybody be able to rent a place in a nice neighborhood? Is it should everybody be able to have a car? You know, what what is the standard by which constitutes and no one can tell you that, guys. No one can tell. You. They can all put a number on it, but it's an arbitrary number that they come up with. Should the minimum wage be $10 an hour or $20 an hour? But the general idea is that you need to be able to pay someone a livable wage. But here's what happens. Because the general idea is, is, that, is that individuals look at, and this is a lot of progressives uh, in, in a society, look at this and they say, well, the evil corporation is making massive amounts of profit and therefore, and they're, they're exploiting the worker for their own benefit. Now, here's what I thought. I thought that if an employer, if you were lucky enough to find someone who had taken on the risk to create a business and now was offering you a job at any price, that if you have no job, that's not exploitation. That's a blessing. Because it means I got something. I used to drive around on the little streets in Afghanistan and in between the, uh, the rows of it would just be like stockpiles of cars. And in between the, the, the little cars would be little kids. Who'd be holding little, little things of uh, of gum, of of candy, and and they would be selling this stuff for you know you buy a pack of gum. I'm sure it cost an Afghan you know a, a penny. It cost me like three dollars uh, because they knew I was an American. But 
they would sell this stuff. And I every time I would pull over on the side of the road, there'd be some kid who'd want to come wash my car with muddy water, right? They have these buckets of just like filth water, and they, they'd want $5 to wash your car. And a lot of people look at that and they say, well, that's exploitation of child labor. What they don't understand is that in that country, jobs are really hard to come by. And it's not a matter of you get a handout. It's like, if you don't work, you don't eat. Those kids go to school for a few hours during the day, and then they get home, and they're out there helping the family. They're helping to put food on the table. The money that they bring home pays for their family to eat. We have no idea in this country. And yet you've got a bunch of do-gooders over here in America who are trying to stop that type of oppressive child labor. But the unintended repercussions of that is that you have starving families and starving children. No one ever considers the unintended consequences. So let's talk about the unintended consequences of an unemployment rate hike. What initially happens in any time you transfer wealth from one place to another is you see a boost. So, for example, you raise it from $7.25 to $10 an hour, and all of a sudden, those people who are making $75 are now making $10 an hour, and they love it. So, for people who have a job, it is great. It is awesome. They just got a 40% increase on what the company has to pay them. The problem is, is most people think that, oh, well, that company makes $100,000 a year in revenue. So if it costs them an extra $25,000 a year in increased labor costs, well, that means they'll just make $75,000 instead of $100,000. But it doesn't work like that. Because there are other ramifications besides the, cost of la- before, besides the overall cost of labor that factor into an employer's decision-making process. And we're going to talk about those in a minute. But what ends up happening is the costs of goods and services go up. So what you get is the person who makes minimum wage initially gets a big boost. But what happens over time is the adjustment happens inside the companies and everybody starts to raise weight or raise prices on the goods or services that they create because the labor costs are so high. And pretty soon, the, the, the cost for the goods and services have gone up to match the increase in the labor price. So any benefit that a low-income worker is going to receive is quickly going to be eaten up in the economy as the cost of goods and services go up because the production costs go up. Not only that, most of the places where low-income people work is also the place where most low-income people get their goods and services. Fast food restaurants, um, clothing chains, uh, places like Walmart, which we'll look at here in a minute. All of these types of things are things that affect low-income workers. So it disproportionately affects them when prices increase. So it doesn't help the worker. It does for a very brief period of time, but then any help that might have occurred vaporizes. The second thing that happens is people who want to get a job. Remember, I'm sitting across the table from the manager who's looking at my application and saying, look, you don't have any skills at this. I do need somebody, but I, I'm, I can't pay you any more than X because of all of the other risk factors that are involved here. And so I'm willing, I can pay you X, but I can't pay you any more. Otherwise, the risk just isn't worth it. If it ends up working out, I'm, I, I'll, I can increase your pay, but you coming into the workforce here, I can't pay you more than X amount of dollars, say $5 an hour. Let's just say $7 an hour because that's the minimum wage here. Well, what happens now that we're $10 an hour? And now that same gentleman, that same guy is sitting across the table with his skill set that doesn't meet, that no skills. Guy just got out of prison. He's trying to make a good life for himself. He really has turned his life around. He doesn't want to live that lifestyle anymore. And he shows up and he's just like, look, I just need a job. I don't care. I'll work for anything. Just let me, give me a chance. Let me prove myself. Let me start to build myself back up into society. Or you've got a young kid who's, from the inner city, and he doesn't want to fall into the lifestyle that a lot of these kids fall into. And he says, look, I'm going to make a change, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to try and find a gig. I'm going to work every day after school, and and I'm going to be consistent about it, and I'm going to try and get an education and save my money so that I can go to college so I don't have to live this sort of lifestyle anymore. And he sits down in front of that employer, and that employer looks at him. He says, listen, man, 
I just I can't take I can't take the chance. It, it, I can't get my money out of you. That you there you are there is too many risk factors here, and there are too many things that um the the what I get out of you in production doesn't give me enough profit to make justify the expense. So I can't hire you. You also have the individual the the untold consequences of of shops that don't get opened up somebody who owns a hamburger stand or somebody who owns a small restaurant who decides who maybe under different circumstances with cheaper labor costs would have opened up a second store but now because the labor costs have gotten so high he can't do that or he doesn't feel like the risk is worth what he could potentially receive and benefit so not only does it not help the worker who's getting their wage increase, it also hurts every other worker who's trying to make it and trying to break into the workforce. It tamps down employment, and it also tamps down future expansion. We talked last week in the last show about the stupid comment from one of the reporters talking with Janet Yellen about why entrepreneurs, why businesses aren't roaring back in greater numbers into the workforce. Well, it's obvious why they're not doing it. It's because look at the costs of Obamacare, the regulatory costs of Obamacare. Look at the minimum wage hikes that are uh, on the horizon. Look at the lackluster growth, the, the uncertainty about what's going to happen in the future. And I know I'm running long D, and we're just going to roll with this because I think it's that important. It's no wonder. Not only that, but you also have this, this other garbage about regulation. This is in the Investor's Business Daily this week. Background checks are racist. Government steps up campaign. What they're saying in this article, I'll paraphrase the article, is that minorities, blacks particularly, have a higher felony rate and have, been, have higher felonies than white people. Therefore, if you ask someone if they have had a felony on an application before you hire them, you're discriminating against them as a minority. And you can be sued. Can you believe that? What kind of this is the world that we're living in, and that's what's scary, is that if you'd have told somebody ten years ago that you'd be sued for asking somebody if they've got a felony on their record before they hired them, you'd think that was crazy. But not only is it happening, but the government is sanctioning it. The government is promoting it. So now you got this this guy who's sitting across the table from the fry cook and he's looking at all this stuff and he's saying, man, I was actually before I even tell before I even tie this together, I was talking with a woman the other day whose company was looking at hiring people and they were going through the qualifications that they had and they had a woman who didn't meet the qualification. She uh, compared to the other potential candidates, she didn't pass muster. So they just simply chose not to interview her for time's sake. They said, look, wait, this, is, this is really not going to be the person for us, so we'll interview this set of candidates because they look like they're going to be the most likely to fit the bill. That company was sued by the woman because she didn't get an interview, and she was discriminated against because they didn't interview her for the job. Now, befuddle me, Darren, but I thought the entire point of an interview was to discriminate candidates, to select one from another. And technically, going over the resumes is an interview process. But it doesn't stop the lawsuit. So now you got this guy who's thinking about starting a business or thinking about expanding a business or thinking about hiring somebody new, and he's going, oh my gosh, can you believe this? I'm going to have to bring these guys in. I'm going to have to pay them an excessively high wage compared to the amount of productivity I get out of them. I'm highly likely to be sued either by the government for asking them if they've got a felony or by somebody who's just pissed off that I didn't give them the job because they felt entitled. And you say, at some point, a guy just says, well, screw it. I'm just not going to hire anybody else. I'll contract it out to somebody else. Or I just won't open or I won't expand. This, and we've been talking about this now from the point of business of the small business owner and the point of view of the employee, both the one who, who is getting the raise and all those people who want to get a job. And you can see in every situation, 
how raising the minimum wage and raising the amount of regulation and the amount of legal battle that occurs every single time you, every single change that you make tamps down employment, hurts not only businesses but individuals. But I want to look at this from the big picture. Let's take, because what, what always gets the credit, what always is brought up is a, is a company like Walmart. Because Walmart is an evil, exploitative company that makes billions of dollars a year in revenue and pays its workers pennies and doesn't offer health care, even though they offer health care to virtually every employee. But it doesn't matter because most of them can't afford it because they make so little money. And I want to run through some numbers with you. Now, Walmart actually pays its people more than minimum wage. The average wage that they're paid, the lowest income person in there makes about $8.30 an hour. Okay? And they have a math, they employ about 2 million people, Walmart does, in the, in the United States. Many of them low-income, part-time workers, granted. Okay? They also have a program inside of Walmart where you can continue to move up the ladder if you do well. Same thing as McDonald's. And virtually every other large corporation in the world has some sort of employee program that allows people to move up and advance if they're good at what they do. But I want to run through some of the numbers here. Walmart's at about $8.30 an hour. Let's assume that half of Walmart's workers are part-time, right? And they make, uh, they're they working 30 hours. Well, not 30 hours. they got, they got to work 27 now. Working 27 hours a week at about $8.30. And we're, and we're doing that in order to try and... Uh, average in what what the costs are to Walmart for their part-time low-income labor force. So every single hour, Walmart spends $8.3 million on labor. Every hour that it, that their that their company exists, $8.3 million in labor goes out. Now, that's just for the part-time workers. That's for half their workforce. The other half makes in excess of the $8.30 an hour, and so they're making significantly more. The costs are large. Okay, but this is just the part-time folks. That's $224 million a week. That's roughly $10,500,000,000 a year in labor cost. Now, if you add to that an increase to $10.10 an hour, and you said to Walmart, hey, Walmart, you got to go from eight thirty to ten ten. That takes you up to an extra $3 trillion a year in labor cost. That's an increase of roughly 30% on their labor cost. Now, Walmart makes their net income, so that, for those of you who are not technically or are not financially savvy, net income is the income that they, they actually take home. It's like your take-home pay. After the government takes their chunk and you pay for your health, your percentage of your health care and you put a little money back in retirement, what do you actually take home in your paycheck? That's the net income. The net income that Walmart makes every year is $14.3 billion of profit. So if we add $3 billion a year of labor costs onto that, because that's what it'll cost to raise everybody up to $10.10 an hour, that's, an inc- that's a decrease of 20% of their net revenues. Now, here's the question that I want to pose to you. What do you think will happen to Walmart's share price if next year or next quarter they post a 20% reduction in revenue? The stock price is going to collapse. It's going to fall apart. Now, what sort of now? A lot of you say, "Well, I don't invest in the stock market, Jason. I don't have that kind of money." Well, you know who does invest in Walmart stock and blue chip stocks like that? There's a lot of folks. Retirement funds. Any you got a retirement fund? Pensions. You work for the police or fire department in your city. What about college endowments? Some of those things that provide your kids the endowment that they work hard and they go to school uh, that that is going to allow them to have a, uh, you know, some money to go to school with. It's going to allow that college to continue to operate. All of those people invest in Walmart stock. It's not just the rich and powerful. It's everyday Susie and Sally. It's Grandma Joe who needs that money in her retirement and is counting on the dividend revenue that it produces in order to live off of. Those people invest in what? It's not rich people who get hit when stock prices decline. It's everyday Americans. It's you. You get hurt. Not only that, 
but it also prevents Walmart from expanding its operations, as we talked about before. Walmart employs 2 million people in America. 2 million! And they're ever-expanding, offering opportunities to those people who couldn't get a job somewhere else. Old folks who are living on a fixed income, who are trying to get a little extra money, are working as the greeter as you walk in. Those who have physical and mental ailments are in their stocking shelves. Walmart provides opportunities to a host of people who otherwise would not have an opportunity, and it also provides low-cost goods and services for that same community. Lower prices than they can find anywhere else. There is an incredible service that's done there. And yet all anybody ever looks at is the fact that they're not paying that worker what they think that worker ought to be willing to ought to be able to make. The minimum wage in every situation hurts an economy. It hurts the individuals, it hurts the companies, it hurts the workers, both those who are getting the wage increase and those who are trying to break into the workforce. If you eliminate the minimum wage, if you reduce it and you allow employers to compete for price, for compete for a workforce, everything gets better. Lower inflation, lower cost inflation, lower, you know, more opportunity, more people in the workforce, lower unemployment rate. It all improves. When government gets out of the way and we stop, trying to fudge with the economy. But until people wake up, I know a lot of you guys are watching like, man, I had never thought about that. I had never seen it from that angle before. That's why this show exists. That's why we that's why I'm here. I I have a I I have a desire an overwhelming desire to teach this stuff because it doesn't get taught anywhere. No one explains it. Nobody walks you through the progression. And if you believe in this show as much as I believe in this show, then I'm asking you to go to Patreon, patreon.com forward slash the live show and donate. Help me bring this show out. Help me share this show. And help me keep this show going because it is, it is critical that we take these events that are in the news and these concepts and ideas and we break the lies and the distortion. Because if not, we're all living. I know a lot of you guys are out there. You're great people. You love folks. You want everybody to make a good living. And up until this show, you thought, well, yeah, I mean, absolutely we need to raise the minimum wage. We can't have people living in poverty. Not in America. Not here. But when you understand what it does to an economy, when you understand the economics behind it, it starts to make less and less sense. And you start to realize that the unintended consequences of helping someone is that you're actually hurting them. You're hurting them, you're hurting yourself, you're hurting the companies, and you're hurting a host of people who are trying to make it in this this country. Guys, I want to thank you for joining me today. It has just been a pleasure to talk to you. I know we ran a little bit long. Um, and, uh, but I just felt like this was something that, that I had to share with you guys today. It's been on my mind. It's been on my heart for a while. And please leave me your comments. Go to the Facebook, go to, uh, go to the live show.tv and leave me a comment. Go to, uh, go to the, the, the podcast on iTunes, leave me a review give me a, give me a few stars that, that all that stuff helps. So until next time, we're going to be back next week, and we'll be hitting some more of this. We'll be talking more about what's going on in the world, more about the repercussions that governments and individuals make and, uh, and their, how they affect your life. So until then, be safe, be good. I'll see you then.